there are a lot of people who would come to me with the diagnosis of PTSD. And they would say, I have been treating PTSD for so long. I don't know why I'm still stuck on this. Um, in the work that we did, I could help them see the more nuance of what they were dealing with. So whether it was more moral injury or more complicated grief or more disenfranchised grief, shame, guilt, there's so many things that are more nuanced than a PTSD diagnosis. And when they were presented with, with these other terms, it was really validating for them because it helped them feel seen for more of what they were actually experiencing. To answer your, to answer your question, the part of it is the labels. Part of it is when people are given certain labels or given certain medications, they feel like, I guess I just am this thing for the rest of my life. Or I guess I just am this way for the rest of my life. Or I guess I just have to be dependent on meds for the rest of my life. But it's not, it's not true. Those are all labeling symptoms or dealing with symptoms. But if you can get to the root of what's going on, a lot of times you can completely shift your experience and how you live in the world and feel in the world. My name is Thad David. I'm a former Marine Recon Scout sniper with two deployments to Iraq. As a civilian, I've now facilitated hundreds of personal and professional development trainings across the country. And it struck me recently that the same things that help civilians will also help veterans succeed in their new roles as well. Join me as we define civilian success principles to inspire veteran victories. Welcome to another episode. I'm here today with Jackie Jones of Flourish Momentum. How are you doing, Jackie? I'm wonderful. How are you doing today? Um, I'm just absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for jumping on. Um, I know you've, you've done a ton of work with active duty military, with veterans that you're doing now. And I, I'm, I've been very excited for this conversation. And so thanks for taking some time. Uh, if if you could, I know you worked with uh, what you're doing now. And then also you in the past, you worked with uh, kind of active duty military members. What What did you do? If you could just share a little bit, how did you get into it? What did you do there? Of course. Okay. So uh, first career, I was an art teacher um, and okay. I had... I had goals of working with at-risk youth. When I was in school for art education, um, I wound up volunteering, I mean, leaving college early and volunteering in Brazil for a while. Um, and when I was working with homeless kids and moms in Brazil, I felt like I would have had more of the impact I would have wanted to have if I had an art therapy approach versus an art education approach. Um, came back, became an art teacher because that was my track. I had already, um, was on my way to getting my master's in art education. But as soon as I started there, started night school with art therapy being my goal. Um, and so it would have, I was on the track to do art therapy with kids. Um, and when I was a teacher, though, an, an art teacher, things would come up in the kids' artwork. And um, I was interested already in the intersection of art and psychology, where I was noticing these like flags coming up in the artwork, but it wasn't my role to process them or address them with the kids. I had to show the artwork to a guidance counselor, and then it would never circle back to me. And so Number one, I didn't really like how I'm the one who created the container for these things to come up, but I I wasn't allowed to be part of the the processing part. Um, and then also as a teacher, it was very clear that when you're dealing with, let's say, behavioral issues in kids, um, there's only so much you can do when you realize that that either they're learning something from home or they're reacting to something from home. It's also not your role to become a therapist for the parents, right? So, um, and also when I left teaching to go to school for art therapy, the PTA president at the time pulled me aside and said, 
friendly, but he said, no matter what you do, don't go work with adult men because they're not going to get this. They're not going to appreciate what you're bringing to the table. And I took that as a challenge. I was like, okay. But in my mind, I was like, okay, noted. That's a challenging (laughs) population. I'm probably going to seek it out. Um, When I was in school for art therapy, I did my first year-long internship with kids with cancer. Um, But when you're in school for art therapy, you do a lot of analyzing your own life. Um, and a lot of things were coming up for me that I was dissecting in my own life and that I was investigating in my own life. And, um, so number one, I had the experience of being a teacher and learning that to address some of the issues that were showing up in the kids, you would really need to be working with the parents. And can I ask you about that actually? Cause just out of curiosity, you mentioned yeah. flags with artwork. I, I'm really what is a flag from a a kid's artwork what would that look like like what what did you notice there yeah actually okay so this is a this is a good tie for where i wound up let's say so i had the student um in particular who who i better understood later when i learned all about art therapy and psychology and development and this kind of thing but he would be in the middle of a drawing and it would be on 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 track. And then all of a sudden, we'd have like five minutes left of drawing that day. And he would like take the black pastel and just color over the entire thing. So he'd go from having a picture that was the assignment to blackening his whole paper. Or, or it, he would have like a normal second grade project would be like an architecture project, like um, design a a dream home or something based on these different principles and everything would be going according to plan. And then at the last 10 minutes, he would like draw a bomb all over it or something. Um, so things like this. And okay. then when you can't be part of the processing, you don't know if it's influence from a video game or influence from a bigger brother or if He has anger toward people in the school. And so you, things come up that you, you want to better understand is this, what's this kid going through? What are the emotions underlying this? Um, Because you don't want to read into something incorrectly, but you're not, that's not your role. It will circle back to when I started working with the military, actually. That same thing. I was just curious because I'm thinking, I'm looking at my kids' artwork. Like I have a, my son drew me a heart within a heart within a heart. So I was like, I wonder <laughs> how am I going to analyze all the drawings they bring home from school? So I was just, I was just curious to know what, what that was. It's a very intriguing thing. I would have never thought to think about the, the psychology inside of what's taking place um, while kids are drawing, but it makes, it makes perfect sense. And so you wanted to be part of the uh, processing of it and you kind of followed of that it. pathway. Yeah. And so where did you yeah. end up after the, all of this? Um, so at the same time, also uncovered things about my family, like an uncle who had served in Vietnam, um, died, um, from ODing and my grandfather, um, who I never met cause he was died before I born, he died before I was born. He had escaped the Holocaust. So that's number one. But number two, he wound up being a service member um, for the U.S. And later on, um, he died and he died in a train track. So they don't know if it was suicide or malicious. Um, And and also I was in a a relationship where there was. uh, The other family had just long-standing prejudices they couldn't overcome, couldn't see me as who I am as a person. And, but it was rooted in conflict in other areas of the world and other times. And um, so all of these things came together and it's like, okay, it's more than just a challenge to go work with like, quote unquote adult men. There were lots of reasons that I 
it would have made sense for me to go work with kids, but I felt more and more guided to go work with the military um, in particular. And uh, so my second year internship when I was in grad school for art therapy wound up being at NICO. So I was at the National Intrepid Center of Excellence at Walter Reed um, for a year-long internship providing art therapy there. And it was a phenomenal experience. And while I was there, um, the Intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund was had gotten the money and was breaking ground on outpatient settings that would be like the NICO, but the NICO program was only four weeks. So especially SEALs would be sent there to do TBI, PTSD assessment and rehab for four weeks, but then they'd return and they would have nowhere to do the same sort of modalities that they had just been exposed to. So for example, someone may have really been taken to art therapy, but there is, I mean, you can get a lot in four sessions, like one time a week for four weeks. Um, but it's more uncovering the root of what's going on. Um, generally, you need longer than that to then, once you have the root of what's going on, uh, process it and integrate the changes and, and transform within yourself. So anyway, then that's just art therapy. But, you know, people would receive acupuncture there and then have nowhere to keep getting it or, you know, that kind of thing. So um, they okay. started breaking ground. Yeah. No, it makes me think of like if, if I ever have a gap of time where I stop working out and kind of get out of shape, you know, I have that moment where I work out for a month and then you kind of hit that crossroads where it's like, you know what, I can, I can go back to eating cheeseburgers. I can. And then you let yourself kind of slide, but you're feeling good. And then what I'm hearing is they come to you for four weeks, experience some good stuff, and then they go back to their units. Yeah. And then, and then they're... they don't have it back in the same old uh same old without actually having access to it and just for for clarity's sake yeah. what is a typical you mentioned acupuncture what does art therapy consist of just so we can kind of follow along what somebody might be doing for four weeks so um what does art therapy consist of well so this was at the night it was four weeks um okay and and they've changed the program a bit since then but from there, we would do masks the first session, first week. Second week was writing. Uh, third week was a montage experience. And then fourth week would be um, being able to finish any one of those projects if they weren't done yet or doing something more individualized for the okay. person. Um, because the first three would be groups, and then you'd usually have a one-on-one. -on -one. So just one-on-one -on -one with people. Um and then the year I happened to be there as an intern, they were breaking ground on a site at Fort Belvoir. So that was going to be the first satellite center to open. That would be um, set up very similarly to the, the NICO, except it, the point was that it would be outpatient. So people could still be living at home, still be working. Um, with their unit every day, but then also be able to incorporate, you know, longer term treatments along the way. So I, even though the art therapy at NICO was really successful, they initially weren't going to include the art therapy at the Fort Belvoir program. So I had written a proposal to the National Endowment for the Arts and was granted some pilot funding, essentially. Um, and I presented at Belvoir and said, you know, this is everything we're doing at NICO. Why you should uh, give me a chance to bring it here. And they just gave me a room and they weren't paying for me at that point. They just gave me a room and like three months to try to embed myself. Um, and within those three months, it was really, everyone took to it very well. So then I became a contractor, and within that first year, they already created a GS position for me. And from there, it grew. Wow! And circling back to the story about the kid in school that I was talking about, when I first came into the Fort Belvoir clinic, the reason that 
I think people took to it so quickly was they had uh, really established psychologists, psychiatrists who in, in talking to certain clients um, would do what they would normally do. But then there were a couple of clients in particular who would bring in artwork that they were making, whether they created a sculpture at a community um, ceramic center or had drawn an image at home that they brought in to share with the psychologist or psychiatrist. And uh, like one, for example, one of the first ones brought to me, I'll tell this story more simply. One of my very first days there, um, the psychiatrist came up to me and he said, this is the artwork that's, that so-and-so is creating. Do you think you can work with this? It's like, of course, because as a art therapist, you're trained to be able to process no matter what is shown in a piece of work. So whereas another provider may be hesitant to uh, like analyze incorrectly um, a piece of artwork of someone blowing their head off, this is the kind of thing that would show up like it would show up in sessions and in the processing through art therapy, you know, the difference of, is this a call for help because someone's about to end their own life? Or is this someone depicting what it feels like to have a TBI? Or is this what someone is, how someone is expressing how they feel like they're just exploding emotionally? So Whereas in schools, a lot of times you have to shut down certain symbolism before you can really get to the root of what it means. It was really nice working for the military and um, having the ability to not shut down what came up, but to just be able to authentically process it. Mm. And so what do you do when you, I mean, what does that processing look like? I mean, what, what do you do after that point or what would you, what did you do in those situations? Well, it, uh, it varies across the board, but so I'll say that, uh, in psychology, a lot of times they're taught to analyze artwork, meaning that certain symbols mean certain things, but in art therapy, um, we are taught that the same symbol could mean something very different for everyone who creates it. So instead of taking someone's art and just analyzing it for them, it's very much a process of you're sitting with them while they're creating. You're aware of, of the sequence that they're creating different things in. You're aware of the energy that they're creating different parts of the picture picture or sculpture or painting, whatever it is in, um, you're aware of, uh, like the order or the placement you're looking at, um, at body cues, you're really observing so many different things. And then after the person has created what they've created and it's there on the table, number one, we have a, a triangle that occurs where it's no longer like a dynamic between a therapist and a client. It's the therapist and the client and the artwork becomes a third party, which helps it be removed from the client. So they can not feel like they're talking about themselves quite so much and they're describing the artwork. And through the, okay. des the describing of the artwork, you can learn a lot and help guide them through um, really getting the insight into why they did things in a certain order or like you can really analyze the um, dynamics of things on a page. So ju just as an easy example, someone who made a mask one day in his very first session was able to look at it and say, Oh my God, I thought that X thing was affecting me 5%. But I see that that one thing is actually affecting me like 95%. So that thing that I wasn't dealing with because I didn't think it really mattered is actually what I should be dealing with first. So you get to mm. 
really can really help people communicate more with their subconscious and learn the, the, the wisdom from what's within. Mm. So does it, does everybody align with this? I mean, does everybody come in and have great experiences with it? And, and it makes me think of, cause I hear of different types of therapy and I always wonder which one is best for, and I would imagine it varies, but I'm just, I'm genuinely curious to know what your thoughts are of if it's, it's positive for everybody or if somebody should dabble in it, what, what thoughts do you have there? If somebody's considering therapy? I, well, I think it can work with everyone. You don't have to be an artist. Um, so initially people avoid it because they think they have to be an artist or they avoid it because they think it's quote unquote hippie shit and it's not going to do anything for them. <laughs> um, so it's less about who it's for and it's more about when it's for the person. So yep. there's some people who would come into the clinic and there's less stigma. Like there's the least stigma associated with like your leg hurting, right? So there are people who might be afraid of addressing any mental health concerns, but they'll show up in the clinic because they need some PT. So then they'll be in PT for a while. And then their PT will start to say, Hey, Jackie, I'm going to refer so-and-so to you because he keeps talking to me about things in our sessions that I am not trained to talk to respond to. Um, so then they might gradually get from PT sent to me, or they might not be ready for art therapy yet. And they might be sent to occupational therapy or speech therapy. And um, occupational therapy and speech therapy was often a brilliant bridge to then come work with us. Because, for example, in speech, they might be learning all of the techniques and strategies that they need to learn in order to deal with their TBI symptoms. But the speech therapist will get to a point where they're like, I don't know why they're not integrating them. They know them. They understand them. I don't know why they're not integrating them. They can't verbalize it to me. And then they would get sent to art therapy because it's a nonverbal therapy. Um, and even when people would go to I mean, there's less stigma associated with going to a social worker than coming to an art therapist. So there would be people who'd come in and they'd be um, ready to see a social worker. And then they would hit points that they just could not talk about. And so the thing about trauma is that when, when something traumatic happens, the verbal areas of our brain become inhibited. And so they're not online when you're really in the, in the depths of experiencing the trauma. So it's really hard then when you're taking a primarily verbal approach to understand what happened and why it impacted you um, because the verbal parts weren't there. So that's where a nonverbal therapy like art therapy is really great because we actually a lot of therapy goes top down, which means like you, you know, something's bothering you and then you understand like the, the emotions and, um, unconscious reactions that were beneath it. But in art therapy, it's the reverse, it's bottom up. So we create an environment where you just create intuitively and then based on whatever was intuitively created, things come up from the subconscious and then you're able to describe what's on the page and then you have meaning and understanding from it. So a lot of people are able to find success through these nonverbal ways of expressing and processing um, that could break through the blocks that they were just getting to verbally. So sometimes it looks like resistance, like sometimes there were providers who thought the clients like just weren't talking, but those clients would come to me and say, I didn't have anything else to say. Um, and so it's, it's, it's important to have all of these different pieces working together. Yeah. So yeah. it's less about who it's for and more about when it's for you. Hmm. 
Well, and I could see some, I love that you pointed out just people say I'm not an artist is probably something I would imagine comes up really quickly. And uh, I'm really intrigued by it. What, what it would, and obviously I would encourage anybody that's seeking it, go see a professional. And I'm curious, like what would be the first, like, would you literally just sit down and start drawing something? Is that? Well, in our, in our therapy, we, it, it's funny. It kind of seems like we're doing nothing, but we're actually okay. we're actually doing a lot. So like in a first session, it would be hard to take someone who doesn't consider themselves an artist at all and mm-hmm. just give them a blank piece of paper and say, draw something because it's, um, it's kind of like the container of possibilities is too wide and the person would uh, shut down or not know where to start. Mm. And so we think a, a lot about the right amount of a container to provide someone and then the right directive so that they have um, ample opportunity for genuine self-expression within that container. So, okay. yeah, it looks it looks very different in every session, but there's there's a, a method to the madness. There's a reason that will give a mask versus a piece of paper versus a canvas. And there's a reason we'll give colored pencils versus charcoal versus magazines to cut up. I'm sensing a, a Marine Corps eating crayons joke somewhere yeah, that somebody so listening many. is probably going to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you didn't mention those because us Marines are just going <laughs> to eat the, eat them. Um, you, you mentioned the, and it, it's something that I, talk about it in other areas, but I, so when the container of possibility is too large, people shut down. Yes. Yeah. Why, why is that? <clears throat> I think cause there's time for them to get in their head. Okay. I think there's time for you to get in your head and you put in your own self judgment before you can let your intuition start to guide you. So we give just enough container that the direction is there, but there's also freedom to self-express. Mm. And there's a, a sculptor, and I, I forget her name. I want to say Shannon King, um, but it's a, it's a favorite quote of mine. Process frees us from the poverty of our own intentions. And uh-huh. she just mentions that once you have your median, like she's a, a, a sculptor, but if you're just thinking about the artwork, you just... In the very same light, you don't really know. But once you say, you know what, I'm going to pick this medium, I'm going to do this on this piece, then your freedom starts and the creativity starts to come out because you've dialed in of where you're going with it. And that's what I thought of when you were talking about the container is too big is just her quote. I think it's it's really cool how it lines up. Um, so I'm curious to ask, what was the, because I'm sure you've seen a lot of different things. So the biggest, uh, I don't know. I don't know of a better word to call it, but success story or biggest benefit somebody's got from it that you saw as much as you can share. Obviously, these are private sessions, but I'd love to know what what are some of the good things that you've seen come out of it or specific stories? Yeah. Um, well, first, can I address something you said about the quote that that artist Please, said? I would, Yeah, I would love to. Uh, what that made me think of was because my my background, I was an artist and I was an art teacher. And that whole process, what people are used to is where it's product oriented. So you have a goal in mind, you create your thumbnail sketches, you think about how you're going to make it happen, and then you actualize it. And that does play into art therapy too. But generally art therapy is process over product. So you try to get you, the goal is to get people, get people creating um, where it's more process oriented. They're using a color in that moment because that's what feels right to use in that moment. They create a certain image a certain way because that's what they're guided to create in that moment. And then the product comes and then you can explore the product to see everything that it meant to you. Um, but it winds up being, so this circles back to the last question, because I think a lot of people understand art as being product oriented. So if you just give someone on their first day, a blank piece of paper, there's this pressure 
that they they need to be like Michelangelo or they're going to be a laughing stock in the room. But if you can really bring it back to actually just see this as problem solving, just literally grab the first color that's speaking to you, create the, the a mark in a way that's most speaking to you right now and the, the product will come. And then once, once someone is on that path of creating intuitively, they get in that flow state um, and their inner wisdom can really come up on the page before they have a chance to shut it down. So, um, and it was really freeing for me actually to, it was hard at first, honestly, going from being an art teacher to becoming an art therapist because I had all these natural ways of being that were more ed appropriate. Um, I had to learn how to rein that in and like save the art ed for later when it would be helpful for a person and not shut down their authentic self-expression. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So I just wanted to respond Can, to that. And yeah, no, I, I, I'm glad that you, you did pause and you mentioned something that kind of gave me a, a thought of just getting into flow state. And I think that's something that I've heard time and time again of various things that of, of therapy or just things that can help people help veterans flow state seems to be a, a common thread of somehow getting into that flow state. And mm-hmm. why, why, do, why is that so important to get into that flow state? Oh, so many reasons. Number one, it helps you quiet your mind. So a lot, so um, going this, this weekend, I'll be doing the next week at outdoor odyssey, which I'm really excited about. I'm going to be bringing Zen tangle there. Um, it's a mindfulness drawing technique, and this is what I've been contracted by VAs to offer as well as classes. A, a reason it's so good is because it's it's doing art therapy without the processing. It's help, It's teaching people how to get into flow state without processing things. So they're quieting their mind when they didn't think they could quiet it. Time flies by in ways that they haven't experienced. If they're dealing with pain, the pain goes away. If they're dealing with anxiety, the anxiety goes away. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also a, a a boost of dopamine. So when people feel like they have a hard time accessing that naturally, this is a way that you can do that. So chemically, it's really good for you. It makes people feel happy and connected and joy um a lot of feelings that they thought were turned off in them just by getting into flow state just by being fully present and knowing that if they can get totally fully present the pain that's usually nagging them subsides or the thoughts that are usually nagging them subside Mm, that makes just a ton of sense i'm so happy we we took this little journey down into into flow state and different things because um and and how would you best just for anybody listening to i don't know that i've ever defined it it's always just a feeling that i've never put a definition to but just for anybody listening that might not have defined it do you have a definition for flow state of, of what that actually means to you there to me yeah so there or, there is yeah. a definite yeah there is a de- yep. there's a definition it's been it's a coined term um but it basically involves it it means when you're so immersed in something that you're basically you're so immersed in something your physical needs fall away. So like you forget you're hungry, you forget you're thirsty, you're not really thinking, you're just totally immersed and one pointed focused on something. Um, and it comes with, yeah, being fully present for me, how I would get deeper in that is how, so as an art, so I got into art when I was born, I mean, since I've been born and I got into yoga and meditation in my later twenties. And so the whole time that art was my thing and even working in the military, I'd have chaplains or I'd have bosses telling me like, oh, you're not doing spiritual things. Oh, you're not like art therapy is not spiritual. I'm like, no, people are having spiritual experiences in here. 
and it is my spiritual where I go to to tap into that and to be connected to something greater than me and to tap into that inner knowing that I can't know just from my own like busy mind. Um, and so it's really, so I think like flow state is you're doing an activity that gets you so immersed, you're fully present in the same, and you wind up with like a, a transcendent experience where you you tapped into creativity that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise, or you tap into um, ways to problem solve, or your awareness grows in ways that you wouldn't have been able to if you didn't do something to expand yourself. Yeah. So for me, it's kind of like the bridge between like an activity that a waking state person is doing to get so fully present and immersed that they wind up expanded in some way. Right on. Do you think there's a correlation? Because I, it made me think of in the military and, and thinking of being in, in combat is a hundred percent. I mean, you're getting into flow. It, it, it'd be hard to not get into some sort of a flow state uh, being in combat, but also just, I mean, for anybody that wasn't in combat, but I ended up speaking from veterans perspectives, but it, when you go into these, um, even just going to boot camp, going into your primary schools, and, and a lot of times that flow state, I think it's forced upon you. Is there a correlation there just for uh, that connection point, that familiarity? Yeah, I think I know how to answer a question, but yeah. So the first thing that comes to mind, and you can redefine your question if I'm not hitting it right. But there would be some people who would come come to sessions and they would be really hard and like trauma processing sessions in my the earlier years of doing art therapy with the military. There was someone in particular who one day told me that he builds it into a schedule to come to art therapy and then go to the shooting range before he goes back to work. And at first I took that as like, oh my goodness, he's like going to get out some rage. But then he explained it to me like, no, that's how I know to control my breathing. Like that is the one place I know how to control my breathing so much that I'm mm. uh, calm and stable. Um, like that was his main way of emotionally regulating. And so that's really good information um, because then I could start bringing like you know, the yoga and meditation, breathing into sessions and not have people leaving feeling like they needed to go to the range, but also <laughs> like, that's, a, that's a really, I mean, that's a really good, I think, connection point to understand. But it, I know there's a ton of great benefits and everything you mentioned was great. Uh, just tie in of, of a definition of it, why it's important to get into it. And it just, made me think that if people aren't getting into it and it's so good to find it again, I'm pretty confident anybody in the military had definitely experienced it while in, uh, while they were in the military. And then if they get out, um, obvious benefits of doing it for the benefit of just getting into flow state. But I wonder what that, yeah. Um, it's been interesting for me, the, the breathing, which I'm excited to talk to you about more is when we get to it, because I've been doing a lot of running and heart rate training and being very intentional with everything that impacts my heart rate at all times. And it's been pretty fascinating. So I'm, I'm excited to ask you about that in a little bit, but I don't want to derail us from where we're at. And I did ask you earlier, I thank you for taking this side road because it was um, very beneficial for me. I, I really enjoyed it. What success stories or story, what, what are the benefits? What have you seen people kind of get on the back end of, of going through art therapy? Um, so many. So the first thing that, the first thing that comes to mind is how many people have said, I don't think I'd be here anymore if it weren't for the work we did together. So mm -hmm. that's huge. And, um, so many success stories. So there's ones of, you know, people who through the art therapy, really came to art and and created a whole second career out of it. Um, people who came into the art therapy not having made art before and then wound up exhibiting their pieces afterwards and, and connecting with others in that way. Um, and then there's 
success stories that you would never even know someone went to art therapy. Like uh, one example comes to mind, um, someone who was so ashamed of something that he had accidentally done um, that he totally shut off from his family. And he just, in his mind, there was no way that if his wife knew he had done this thing that she would ever accept him as a person. Um, and he, he carried this and it was eating him up and it was really affecting his whole dynamic at home with his family um, and internally. And so we spent time identifying what that thing was and then doing work to process through it and then integrating it within him enough that he could accept himself enough for it that he felt ready to talk to his wife about it. And so then we created, we set up a session where he invited her into a session so that he could share this with her. And then the thing is, when he shared it, um, she said, I know you've, you've basically, he had told the story when he was blackout drunk one night. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was like a year prior. So it was really healing for him to know that she never left him. She didn't view him differently after even knowing that, like before he even came to art therapy to work through it. But but also going through the art therapy brought him to the point that he accepted himself enough to even be able to bring it up. And that's, that's just one example, but there's people who, uh, a lot of Marines in particular are like so passionate and they, um, really so many Marines <clears throat> would when they're so upset about things, um, the like physiological symptoms were great. Um, not just Marines, but this happened a lot. I had people so angry at themselves that they like burst their abs from the inside or who were constantly um, passing out, like just blackout passing out in random places when their stress would get high or um, whose heart rates would send them to the ER and they wouldn't even know what they were thinking of. Um, and so for one person who was having a lot of um, medical issues, it really stemmed from the fact that he had over 60 losses, whether they were people who served under him, um, who were who were killed during combat or there were people who came home and committed suicide or, or came home and died of something medical later. Um, but he had, he was carrying, um, over 60 losses. Um, and in the art therapy, he is someone who on the first day he left, um, because he knew it was, um, he knew it was going to open him up, but he came back and apologized and we worked together. Um, and, and it was really deep and we did a lot of work together. And, and one of our culminating projects was actually going through and processing all of those. It was like 67 deaths, um, mm -hmm. and creating a piece. And so he was able to really unpack each person each experience, um, how he wanted to integrate each person forward, and then created this really beautiful commemorative artwork that he has in his home. So, and then there's a reduction in medical issues um, and a reduction in all the ways that stress just can kill you from the inside out. Um, so a lot of stories like that. I, I, that is fascinating what you just shared and circling back to the first thing that you had talked about with the, um, gentleman that didn't want his uh, spouse to know, or he didn't, she didn't want to be judged. And aside from the fact that she already knew, but he was carrying this burden. I think that will 
resonate with several people because a lot of times I think we carry this burden and we hold it in because we don't want to be judged. And it's a really incredible story. And even more so the fact that she had already known about it and he was still carrying it even though she had already known and then was Mm -hmm. obviously didn't leave him. So uh, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing all of this about art therapy Mm -hmm. and what are you doing currently? I know we, we talked about quite a bit and went down some of that stuff. What are you currently doing uh, right now with with flourish momentum? Yeah. So after, after Balfour, I went to Eglin air force base. So um, okay, the air force base was the last, branch to have a, or the Air Force was the last branch to have a Invisible Wounds Center. Um, they opened their first one at Eglin. So I got to go there and be one of the first staff people there. Um, and there I built up the art therapy program, but also I got to teach yoga and meditation there as well. So I got to start um, kind of co-treating, like even within myself. Um, and there were people that would come for art therapy. There were people who would just come for yoga or IRS yoga nidra. And there were some people that would do both. And I had found it important to start to integrate the yoga and meditation because in the art therapy, people would get so much insight and self-awareness and increase empathy for self and others and feel less isolated and um, lessen uh, shame and guilt and improve their mood and all these things. But a lot of times they would have the insight and self-awareness, but then they'd say things like, I know I should feel more happy, but I just haven't felt happy in so long. I don't even know what that feels like in my body anymore. Um, and so the yoga wound up at first being a place to help people somatically feel into these emotions that they wanted to start feeling into more that they just essentially their body forgot how to feel into them. Um, but then it it became more than that, especially at Eglin, there were so many, um, I worked with a lot of, uh, green berries who are like constantly still deploying. And when you're, you know, coming to a session or two and then going away for months, like back into a combat situation, it's not good for you to be like opening up, closing up, opening up. It's just, it's difficult. Um, when you're in combat, you have to be really externally focused And if you get too internally focused, then it puts you in danger, right? So the yoga wound up being, so in that setting, art therapy was really good um, for people who were like about to transition out and had more time to really focus on their mental health and kind of processing through anything they didn't want to carry forward the effects of as they moved into their, you know, post-retirement life. Um, But the people who are still constantly in a a deployment cycle, yoga was actually really helpful for because they didn't have to process anything. They didn't have to open up. It was just more like a, a place where they could get so present. Their mind was clean and clear and quiet. It was a place where they could practice, um, meeting parts of themselves that they were uncomfortable with, but in a compassionate, accepting way so that those things didn't have to carry the same, um, like emotional reactionary weight that they would if they didn't, uh, meet them in the yoga nidra. Um, there are people who in one session, things that used to cause nightmares would just become dreams. And so it wound up being a really nice way for them to have therapeutic effects of having less nightmares, being able to quiet their mind, um, working through emotions they were struggling with without having to open up and process anything. Hmm. And then the people, yeah. What were you going to say? 
Oh, I was just going to say, and then the people that I could do both with who were there for a while, um, I just got a deeper sense of kind of how to, to, to interplay the modalities and um, what makes the most sense to give someone when. And then that, that led into eventually going private. So with, um, so just quickly to make the bridge and we can dive into what aspects uh, you want to, but, um, as a, as a provider, there's a lot of, you know, there's compassion fatigue, there's vicarious trauma, there's using all your tools on yourself, but, um, and then also getting help. But, but when you're treating trauma, like, nine hours a day, every, every day of the week, that sometimes you, you start to lose, like, you can feel a feeling, you can feel a reaction. You don't know if it's yours or if it's someone else's that you've absorbed, or, um, it's just important to then have ways to address your, your energy as well, basically. So when there's confusion about like, well, I've worked through this. Is this my grief or is this someone else's? That kind of thing. Um, I wound up getting into Reiki and that was really helpful for clearing the things that I had already worked through psychologically, that I had already worked through somatically. Um, and and from there, I I went private so I could bring everything all all together. So I work with people privately now and I address the mind, body, soul, and space. And so I can pull in the art therapy when it's needed. I can pull in the yoga and meditation when that's needed. I can pull in the energy work like Reiki and theta healing and sound bowl therapy when that's needed. I can pull in feng shui when we need to work with the energy of the environment and the space. And so it's a much more holistic approach now. I really loved working in the military settings, but even in the setting where I was brought on to do yoga and meditation too, um, it's like all down to numbers. And so like if my art therapy wait list was longer, sometimes they would just cancel one of my yoga sessions and have me do art therapy instead. And I'm like, I understand, but I also, there's this whole like treatment plan I have going on with people and it's anyway. So now I have more ability to really bring to each person what they need at that time. And so that's what you're currently doing now is, is people contact you, they reach out and you're, you're currently helping, helping them process through items. Yeah. So people come and they have some sort of emotional or physical pain or when they have some sort of block, they just, something's holding them back and they can't figure it out. Um, veterans come and they are tired of doing the runaround. That's not really giving them answers. Um, have people who are able to decrease the medications they've been put on by bolstering their like holistic uh, ability to deal with their symptoms. So people come for a lot of different reasons, but, um, yeah, I provide, I provide them holistic therapy, which means, um, while one person's working with me, they might experience a variety of actual modalities. And you had mentioned, you know, if somebody's tired of the runaround, what are the common, I don't know if triggers is the right word. What are the common things that people would notice or should be looking out for that? It's like, you know what, that I could actually benefit from this. And it's, I would imagine it's a lot more subtle or we think it's subtle because maybe we're so numb to these things that are continually happening. What are those what does it look like in somebody's life where it's like they should look for and maybe consider to come seek some help? Well, I think a lot of people get frustrated when they feel like they are treated like a number. So number one, don't treat people like numbers. Um, they're very much who they are. Everyone has a really individualized treatment plan. Um, Number two, I think people get really frustrated when they feel like they go to provider with a symptom and they're just given a med straight away for it. And then Mm -hmm. they get more frustrated when they wind up being on 
one medication that is causing symptoms. And so then they're put on another medication that addresses those symptoms, but causes other ones. And they just start kind of symptom chasing without dealing with the root. So with this, we can really come to the root. Um, also, a lot of times with mental health, um, I hear a lot of people get frustrated with the VA because like, let's say someone has an anger issue. And so they're put in a, like what's offered is a six week group for anger, but they might not need the psychoeducation. They might not need the group setting. They might need something that's going to really go to the root of their particular anger. So, um, and a lot of times when people go to, when they're assigned a counselor through the VA, the sessions are um, short, either the duration of sessions they're allotted or the individual sessions they feel like are too short to really get into the the meat of what where they need to go. Mm -hmm. um, but also... What's nice about coming here is, is you don't have to talk if you don't want to. So I have really transformative sessions that happen when someone is just laying for an hour and a half receiving sound bowl therapy. And so for them, mm -hmm. they just get to come and completely relax, go into a theta state, which is, feels like you're lucid dreaming. It's really relaxing. And then at the end of it, you have released things that you didn't know how to otherwise, and um, real transformation and shifts happen. It's so like a, a lot of the current feedback I get, especially after the energy sessions is like, I don't know what happened, but I, that just doesn't bother me anymore. Like those kinds of mm. shifts just happen after each session. So there's, you know, That's a lot wonderful. more room to dive deep in so, a different way here. And if there, let's say there's a hundred veterans listening at this very moment in time, that don't know if they need to go see, get therapy or get some help or reach out. You know, if you mentioned kind of anger issues or, you know, what, what are the things that somebody that's listening that isn't even considering this, what are the things that would be signs or symptoms of like, you know what, if this is happening, you might want to consider uh, going to talk to somebody. I would say if your past is driving your future. Okay. So yeah, if anything in your past is getting in the way of you being who you most want to be or living the life you most truly want, then this is perfect. So what I, I come equipped with, you know, the psychology side of things. And so we can, we can meet and process the root, but I also come equipped with the things that help propel people forward in a, um, mm. in a very authentic way. Um, like it, the transformations, the shifts happen internally. Got so it. the thing is, and something that we talk about a lot in yoga and meditation is the subconscious, um, drives your, is your past and your future is the unconscious. So if you don't know how to tap into like expanding your mind, then your past is driving your future. And that's not how to get where you really want to be. It's not your maximum potential. So what is the, cause you mentioned subconscious and then unconscious. What is the difference between uh, the subconscious and unconscious mind? So the subconscious is more like your conditioning. So things that have happened to you, um, may affect your reactions or your triggers or your tendencies. Um, whereas the unconscious is more where you're at when you're just um, like fully present in a state of witness and awareness. Um, it's a deeper wisdom. So like mm. the answer is how to get to where you need to go are within each of us. But when our 
past experiences, our traumatic or our conditioning is really prevalent and loud. Um, it's hard to get beneath that into the the deeper inner wisdom that knows how to get where we need to get. So if I'm hearing this all correctly, the subconscious, the past, the conditioning is almost a blocker for getting into that unconscious, deeper wisdom. Yeah. Okay. I very much appreciate that definition. I'm glad that I, that I asked. I've always wondered, I've heard the differences, but I've never actually stopped and asked some, asked somebody. So that's, that's great. Thank you. And so yeah. do you do work? Oh, what's up? Yeah, I was just going to say so concretely um, in here, if we need to better understand a subconscious block, well, we have the tools for that, like the art therapy. And then if you've already processed through, a lot of times people come, they're like, I've been in therapy for years. Like, I know what's bothering me. I know why, but I can't shake it. So it's getting beneath that um, and being able to drop into these um, like deeper states of consciousness where you can create more of the life that you're seeking. Hmm. Which is the goal. And that yeah. gets back to if your past is driving your, your future, then it might be time to consider, uh, or it, it might be beneficial to go consider uh, speaking to somebody. Do you do any virtual work or is it all in person? If somebody was looking to reach out for, to you and get some help, does it have to be locally or do you do both virtual stuff? Yeah, I do both. So okay. I have um, I have an office. People come in person, but I also can do everything virtually. So I would say it's about half and half right now. For a while, it was like okay. two thirds virtually, one third in person. It's about half and half right now. But yeah, I can work with people from anywhere. And what would somebody do to, to get in touch with you? I do have one more question I want to ask you about, but I, what would be the ways for people to get in touch with you? What's the best way for somebody to, to, to just kind of look into you and see, see where you're at and possibly reach out to, to get some help. So lots of ways. Um, I have a website, it's flourishmomentum.com. So okay. you can on the homepage, click, get, get my free guided meditations um, that will give you a free gift. It will also put you on my email list. There's a contact me form. If any of that is not working, my email is Jackie at flourishmomentum.com. Um, okay. and I'm active on Instagram flourish underscore momentum. So you can DM me or learn more about what I do there. I have over a hundred videos on YouTube. So that's just youtube.com slash Jackie Jones. Um, it's a lot of guided meditations and yoga practices. Yeah. Lots Great. of ways. Well, I'm jotting those down and that those will be ones that I'll just, for anybody listening, I'm going to do my best to link those in the, in the bio, just so they can have quick, easy access. If they're thinking about it, don't hesitate. Just go click something and, and check it out further. And yes. something that I, I wanted to ask you about, and we have, we've talked about it, but what are some of the the things that that you've noticed that have if it's not already something that we've talked about but just that that you've seen is like somebody getting out of the military and going off to hopefully be a uh, live a happy life you know i was going to say successful but i don't know that that's the what what would be the happy life what are the things that they're doing to to live that happy life what are the driving forces that send them off in that direction versus uh, people that are struggling. Uh, have you noticed any correlations there or things that, that, that the people that are living that happier life are doing or not doing? Okay. So this might seem like a roundabout answer, but it's my, it's <clears throat> direct. It's my answer. Um, okay. there are a lot of people who would come to me with the diagnosis of PTSD and they would say, I have been treating PTSD for so long. I don't know why I'm still stuck on this. Um, in the work that we did, I could help them see the more nuance of what they were dealing with. So whether it was more moral injury or more complicated grief or more disenfranchised grief, shame, guilt, there's so many things that are more nuanced than a PTSD diagnosis. And when they were presented with 
with these other terms, it was really validating for them because it helped them um, feel seen for more of what they were actually experiencing. To answer your, to answer your question, the part of it is the labels. Part of it is when people are given certain labels or given certain medications, they feel like, I guess I just am this thing for the rest of my life, or I guess I just am this way for the rest of my life, or I guess I just have to be dependent on meds for the rest of my life. But it's not, it's not true. Those are all um, labeling symptoms or dealing with symptoms, but if you can get to the root of what's going on, a lot of times you can completely shift your experience and how um, you live in the world and feel in the world. So I would say, number one, it's like not getting fixed and 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 stuck in things that may have helped at one point don't necessarily have to be there forever. A lot of times it's really underlying grief and, and shame and guilt. So it's having the avenues to, to have people feel safe enough to go where they need to go to really um, meet and um, integrate the parts of themselves that they may be doing everything they can to hide from. It almost made me think of with hearing you describe it and then just kind of reflecting on everything that it it almost feels like these items that are stuck with us would, would almost be comparable to uh, i think back in the day they would you could buy a car that had a governor on it that wouldn't allow it to go over x speed and it's almost like going in and really going through therapy that it's it it, it can almost remove that governor and allow the full potential to go forward at whatever speed or direction that you want it to go. Yeah. And I would say a big stuck point at the root of a lot of it is when people just get to a point where they feel like they can't trust themselves. Mm. So they might feel like, I don't know if I can trust myself in a relationship. I don't know if I can trust myself um, home alone by myself. I don't know. There's so many ways that people who are walking people who are walking around the world seeming very confident and like nothing is, is quote unquote wrong with them. But then underneath it all, um, have, a a shame that is just really has a hold on them or who, um, has a feeling like they can't trust themselves deep down. Um, so there's these, blocks that just happen and have people stuck in certain patterns that um, they want to break free of, but, but don't know how until they can work through that, until they can reach that point and work through that point. Hmm. Makes a ton of sense. Thank you so much, Jackie. I, re I really appreciate you jumping on and, and sharing your, your experiences, sharing what you do. And, and uh, most importantly, thanks for all the work you're doing to help to help out the military, to help out veterans. It's, it's really, it sounds like amazing stuff. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It was a wonderful conversation. One million veterans. Empowering one million veterans is my mission. My name is Thad David. And if you like this mission or this podcast, there's a few things you could do to help me out. And number one is just leave a five-star review and let the world know that you enjoyed this show. Number two, follow or subscribe the show wherever you're watching. And number three, share it with as many people as you think would find value in it. Now, if you have direct feedback for me, or if there's anything that I can do to personally help you out, please reach out to me directly at victoriousveteranproject at gmail.com. I truly look forward to hearing from you. Conquer today.